So let me just make sure this screen is up. So good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the first in a series of webinars that the careers team here at the Royal Aeronautical Society um, are going to be bringing you over the course of the next few weeks and months. So um, I'm just um, going to share uh, a screen with you um, which will be up in a few seconds um, sorry just having a few issues here with my screen doesn't seem to want to show um, the slide um, just bear with me one moment okay there we go so Just like to welcome everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to um, sort of kick off this this webinar, which is going to be the first in a series, as I mentioned. So, just to briefly introduce myself, um, my name is uh, Nicholas Davis. I am the employability and skills executive here at the society. Um, bit of background to myself: I actually started my aviation career in airport security. I then moved on to um, the commercial and um, private flight operations sector, um, and also. So in a previous life, I did spend a bit of time working in higher education. My role at the society um, is um, focused more on communicating the awareness and availability of jobs and associated skills, qualifications uh, and pathways within the entire aviation industry. Um, so just so you can see who we all are, um, just going to invite um, our panellists and other speakers to open um, their webcams just so you can see us all. And then I will hand over to my wonderful colleagues who I am delighted to be joined by um, Arpad uh, Sackle, uh, Jenny Edwards, as, as well as my two colleagues from the society, Rosalind Azuzi and Rishi. So if we start the introductions, um, with Arpad, um, followed by Jenny, then Roz and Rishi. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, this afternoon, uh, which will hopefully be a, uh, an exciting uh, session. Um, I work in the field of executive search and um, leadership assessment and um, lead our um, aviation and uh, aerospace efforts at my firm, which is called Salens Plus. We are a London-based um, executive search firm and um, talent advisory um, firm, which predominantly helps clients to um, identify um, any um, um, leadership issues, um, assessing leaders, caliber, um, assessed with um, succession planning, help them meet diversity uh, objectives across uh, various functions, levels and uh, geographies. Um, not limited to transport or aviation, it's the broader uh, industrial sectors uh, that we tend to cover. Uh, prior to search, I worked um, in aviation law um, at um, two um, of uh, London's uh, leading aviation law firms, um, where I handled various EU uh, regulatory uh, matters, including passenger rights, as well as uh, various liability claims handling um, issues. Um, I studied um, air law at the um, uh, Institute of Air and Space Law at uh, Leiden University, which is uh, one of the leading academic uh, research and uh, teaching institutions um, in the world, specializing in um, aviation law and, um, and regulation. So that's uh, my background. Thanks, Arpad. Brilliant. Wonderful to have you. Jenny, shall we, do you want to start with introducing yourself? Uh, hi everyone, sorry my webcam doesn't seem to be working uh, so you're just going to have to imagine my face for this one. Um, uh, so I'm a University of Southampton graduate, I did physics with astronomy there um, and while I was there I did two engineering summer internships, one at a company previously called Archangel Aerospace and one at Rolls-Royce. 
I've been on the Lockheed Martin graduate scheme since um, September 2018, so I've been there for just over a year and a half now. I'm on my fourth and final placement as a graduate, and after that I'll become uh, kind of a full-time uh, systems engineer. Um, so I've done work including research and development projects, operational analysis, um, modelling and simulation. Uh, I've also worked as a technical assistant to chief engineer on one of our vehicles programmes, and I'm currently working as uh, some of the team of research scientists and a systems engineer um, on a defensive space programme. Uh, as well as kind of my, my day job, Lockheed Martin, I'm on the outreach committee, uh, leading the Women in STEM committee. Uh, and I also volunteer at my local Royal Aero branch um, as a committee member for them. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Jenny. Wonderful to have you. So, um, Ros, Rosalind? <laughs> Ross is fine. Um, hi everyone. Um, thanks everyone for joining and particularly to our speakers today. Um, so I'm, I'm Head of Skills and Careers at the Royal Aeronautical Society. So I lead on our activities which cover the outreach programmes, um, uh, events like this for our careers um, and employability work. So we obviously through Nick and Rishi, we do um, a lot of work to try and attract people into the sector and support them through thick and thin. Um, and obviously right now it's a really challenging time and we appreciate that. Um, my, I also look after our diversity inclusion work and um, the ALTA mentoring scheme for women in the industry um, to connect and support each other. Um, and really just here to help advise and support um, and, you know, give a as much as much help as we can. Um, I also work with quite a few employer groups so um, we've been you know having some regular meetings obviously in the last few weeks to look at the COVID-19 impact on both the aerospace manufacturers um, and the aviation side in particular as well um, and we know it's challenging but there are some some you know glimmers of hope as well um, and there are some you know things that I'm sure we'll be able to help you with all today in terms of making some plans for the future. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ros. So, so um, Rishi, if we can start with you, um, uh, start here with you. Just want to introduce yourself. So Rishi's going to be helping us out in the background as well. Um, so Rishi, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to this uh, the first of um, hopefully many webinars to come. Uh, my name is Rishi Radia and I'm the Careers and Outreach Officer here at the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, I've been at the Royal Aeronautical Society coming on to nearly two years now, and uh, my job is to um, look after look after our primary primary school engagement program, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, called Cool Aeronautics. Um, there's been various articles and um, information published about it recent, uh, in recent years. Um, I've also assisted Nick and Ros with a lot of the um, careers work that we do, whether it's um, outreach work, including large scale events such as the World Skills event. Um, also, a lot of the air shows, including Farnborough um, and many other outreach events, including um, liaising with local schools um, across the country to um, sort of promote aerospace to the next generation. Uh, my previous background is uh, stems from the aviation background. Um, I initially um, got my um, airline transport pilot's license many years ago now, about seven, eight years ago. Um, but from then, my career sort of led into um, other operational roles within the aviation industry. Um, with former um, employers, including EasyJet and British Airways. Um, I very much hope you enjoy this uh, webinar today. And um, if you have any questions, by all means, please feel free to ask. So it's great to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. So it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to, to this webinar. Um, I'm just going to invite um, the speakers and panelists just to um, obviously now turn off their, their webcams because some of our internet connections um, are weaker because some of us do live in, in rural areas. So um, I'm just going to invite webcams to um, come off for now and then I'm just going to um, go through uh, a bit of information, a bit of housekeeping before we get started into the themes um, of today's webinar. So overall the session will last around an hour till um, 4 p.m. or it might go over slightly um, from our from our speakers including myself, Arpad and Jenny and then there will be a question and answer session um, at approximately 4 p.m. So please do um, hold your questions until the end when we do announce the um, question answer session. But as we go along, you will see that there is a questions tab. Um, so please feel free to use that and um, ask us questions as we go along and then we will come to them at the end. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible in the short 
perspective you've got. Um, those are questions we are unable to answer. If you would like to carry on this conversation, please do email us um, at careers at Aero Society. Um, you will see the email address there. Um, and there is also some useful handouts as well. So if you go to the handouts tab, um, you will see that there is a few um, resources there for you to download as we go throughout throughout this webinar. So um, just going to move you on now to introduce the themes of today's webinar. Um, so we are going to start off um, by discussing various, various different topics, focusing on the overviews of the markets uh, or the current market situation and the job situation. Um, we are then going to talk about various employability tips and advice, including networking and job search skills followed by our advice on preparation for how to prepare yourself uh, for an upturn um, following this potential downturn. So there's going to be eight themes that we're going to cover all together. Um, and it's going to be three of us that are going to take you through them. And then you'll see at the end there, there will be the, the Q&A session. So um, I'm going to invite Arpad first of all to kick us off with our first theme of the day. So thank you very much. Over to our pad. Thank you, Nick. Um, so everyone, we wanted to give you a snapshot of um, what's happening in the aviation and aerospace um, industry at the moment and what the implications are when it comes to jobs and uh, employability, really. The, um, the International Air Transport Association, IATA, uh, predicts that there will be in the uh, in the region of 25 million job losses across the the sector 11 million of those will be in the asia pacific uh, region here in europe uh, all the major carriers ryanair lufthansa british airways canadian um, air france KLM, we're going to shed as many as um, 32,000 uh, jobs uh, among them uh, their businesses will shrink quite considerably. And uh, it's not only the airlines, of course, but um, the airports, also the um, um, manufacturers like Rolls-Royce, GE Aviation, um, they're um, hoping that the hiring freezes, part-time working and early retirement might soften the blow um, for their employees, but um, there's very little cause for uh, optimism. Um, Hezo Airport uh, reported quite a substantial uh, loss for their first quarter in this year. Last year, they made a, a, a significant um, profit. In the US, um, the situation is very uh, similar. Uh, American uh, United Delta among the airlines have agreed to, um, to take salary cuts and uh, unpaid leaves. Um, and um, they will last as many as nine months it's predicted many of the airlines many of the major airlines will of course be bailed out there's 50 billion dollars um, allocated um, to them maybe on the positive um, because we would like to at the end of this webinar we would like to really uh, leave you with some positive uh, to look forward the whole pandemic um, situation showcased aviations and, and the and the broader aerospace um, communities um, crucial role in returning citizens and, and transporting life-saving cargo uh, to remote communities and which illustrates of course the value of the um, of the air services so some good publicity for the for the industry um, and also um, when it comes to the to the future I mean, aviation and aerospace have traditionally been um, the trail-based blazers when it comes to change management, innovation, um, pioneering new technologies, and they will continue to lead on uh, on this post-COVID-19, um, really. So when it comes to best practices, when it comes to risk and crisis response, um, the industry will be um, an example to, um, um, to others. Uh, wanted to briefly mention what's happening with the flying personnel. I would imagine there are uh, quite a number of you out there who are um, pilots or or, uh, or flight attendants who have been furloughed or already laid off. Um, difficult situation, certainly among the uh, the um, low cost carriers, where most of the um, of, of crews are are employed on precarious employment contracts. Uh, they are self-employed. Uh, Wizair, Ryanair are among the champions of this, and uh, this is of course affecting young pilots uh, who are um, just entering the industry uh, particularly badly. Um, wanted to mention that some of them are involved in pay-to-fly uh, schemes, whereby 
young pilots have to pay the airline for the privilege of um, gaining flight experience on, on their aircraft. So during revenue earning flights. So there will be, of course, increased competition uh, for fewer opportunities and um, formal um, sector jobs. I mean, that's certainly for the next sort of six to 12 uh, months, that will be the, um, the case. Uh, Nick, if you would like to uh, give us a snapshot of the the um, UK uh, industry landscape and um, the road to um, recovery, hopefully. Hello. And thank you very much, Arpad. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so, the, as Arpad was saying, these, the spread of the virus around the world really has sort of resulted in unprecedented changes. So, you know, um, I'm just briefly going to touch on what the recovery could potentially look like. Um, and as you you mentioned, Arpad, you know, the aerospace industry really has. Um, rallied together in this crisis uh, and really responded quite remarkably in terms of the outpouring of, of talent skills um, and dedication you know to providing sort of vital medical and cargo transport um, and refocusing production uh, to vital to produce vital medical equipment um, and also as well as we've seen with um, the airlines with the uh, cabin crew pilots and staff at the airlines that we've seen um, you know they're providing much needed volunteers to assess on the, to assess to assist on the front line so it really just shows the industry is able to sort of rally together but where does this leave us sort of in in the sort of short medium to long term so whilst um, OEM production or original Manufacturer production has taken a hit um, as some airlines are sort of pausing their new aircraft orders and deliveries at the moment. The longer term outlook for the sector does tend to remain fairly positive. Our sector growth is estimated sort of pre epidemic that was actually higher than global GDP growth rates, particularly within emerging markets such as Asia, which drove much of the demand sort of in the build up to, to COVID 19. Um, whilst the sector is not immune, it has survived sort of many crises in the past, such as the financial crash, the SARS outbreak, 9-11, and so on. And you know, growth is um, expected to continue um, in an upward trajectory post-COVID-19, albeit this downturn is predicted to last a bit longer than perhaps other crises that um, have been in the past. Um, with the long-term sort of order book for OE OEMs continue to be fairly strong, um, but at the moment it is quite difficult to predict the sort of long-term aspect of this. Um, but the positive from this is that the industry does have a history of rejuvenating itself sort of in a post-crisis world, um, but this is sort of bigger than anything that we've seen before. So the, the recovery might take um, a little bit longer than usual. Uh, on the environmental and sustainability issue, um, it's evident that global pollution levels across the world have decreased since we entered this, this pandemic, and key stakeholders within the sector will need to obviously refocus efforts on creating you know, a sustainable future of, um, for flying, whether that is creating new aircraft designs, propulsion improvements, such as creating alternative fuels and electric aircraft, to new airspace and air transport management solutions. So companies will need to make sure that their workforce and their skill set within that workforce um, are available and continue to be available um, to solve the issues and come up with the solutions uh, going forward. And then finally, um, Going, uh, mentioning the the airlines. So obviously, this is obviously a major topic in current affairs at the moment with with the airlines. Many airlines did go into this position in fairly strong positions, some more than others. Um, but based on previous incident in, incidents, there is potential to bounce back. We are predicting, or it is generally predicted, that there's going to be a U-shaped recovery. Uh, that domestic aviation will actually see the earliest recovery followed by the international sort of long haul market but there is sort of word on the street and in in a lot of the publications and, and media that it could potentially be a three to five year recovery for the um, airlines so um, it is uh, potentially a longer term effect as well um, so 
um, we're just going to move on. I'll invite Arpad just to talk us through quickly about um, the jobs that are available in aerospace at the moment. So over to Arpad, thank you very much. So yeah, as you mentioned, um, Nick, it's not all gloom um, at the moment. It, it may sound um, very um, pessimistic at the moment, but the, the industry does have a tendency to to bounce back from uh, um, anything from pandemics to uh, to financial crises. So. Um, which are the growth sectors, which are the key areas where um, you will find those opportunities going forward. I think the, it's really important to mention that uh, here in the UK, especially the aerospace sector, the defense sector are um, key um, um, engines of the, of the um, uh, entire economy. Uh, as you can see the figures, um, quite a number of people are uh, working in, in each of those, especially um, the broader aerospace and defense uh, market. Going forward, we will see that um, up and coming um, new um, entrance to the market, especially when it comes to the travel technology, innovation space, uh, that's where the real growth um, is going to uh, come from. I mean, many travel startups are popping up left, left right and center, uh, trying to tackle some of aviation's biggest headaches from baggage handling at airports, cabin design to reflect the new social distancing reality, um, enabling smoother booking and, and better customer service and, and in-flight retail all the way to um, smart flight decks, really. I mean, there's a company called Zumna, uh, which is using blockchain technology to uh, speed up passenger verification um, processes at, at airports. So I think you will have to really think about your careers in a very different way, because when it comes to employment in the sector, uh, certainly for the next um, uh, six to 18 months it will not come from the traditional sort of sources the airports the airlines they will go through um, a rough time i think um, those who will really do well are um, tech heavy uh, sort of uh, uh, organizations that are um, focused on communication um, and and um, yeah, this, this sort of Amazon type of organizations, which are enjoying increased uh, consumer demand, uh, selling vital items across a, a variety of sectors. So I think it's flexibility, adaptability uh, will be key. Wanted to mention that the MRO space, the maintenance repair uh, overhaul um, space will be or is already uh, very active. They will continue to um, require uh, maintenance, service engineers, mechanical engineers, um, performance engineers, and if anyone with a quality, um, quality management um, background will be high in demand. And of course, uh, with the pandemic, uh, health and safety management related roles will be um, front and center going forward, whether you're talking about um, uh, manufacturers or um, any anyone else in the um, supply chain. So it's, it's really about trying to see what's needed at the moment and um, uh, tailoring um, your skills toward that. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to add to this, but uh, if not, it uh, would be really helpful if uh, uh, Nick, could, you could um, um, give us some pointers as to what's happening in the UK European uh, landscape when it comes to uh, the supply chain. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. So just to, um, to mirror um, Arpad's um, words is that you know the industry in the UK, um, or what I'm going to focus on now is is predominantly the the UK side of the the sector. Um, the UK does have one of the world's largest aerospace markets. Um, there are, if you like, sort of sectors within the sector ranging from the engineering type roles, such as the original equipment manufacturers, um, focusing on design and innovation. Um, down to maintenance, repair and overhaul as well as the more commercial roles such as project management and leadership. Um, the industry really does involve quite a diverse range of people as well as skills. So there really is sort of something for everybody, whether you are interested in engineering or whether you're interested in business or management. Um, there is also a lot of transferability between various sectors within aerospace and aviation, but even from non aerospace related backgrounds, you can transfer into 
the industry sort of at um, a later date, you know, whether, you know, it's not the first industry that you um, end up working in, perhaps straight after you graduate from university. It is something that you can come into later um, because the industry really does welcome a broad range of skills from non-aerospace related backgrounds as well that can be transferred into this sector. Um, now, if we move on to this slide here, this just shows you um, an example of what the landscape looks like in the UK. Now, this is taken from ADS Group. Um, this just shows examples of the, the sorts of companies that are around, um, including the primes. So these are the large um, aerospace companies. So these are what's, what we call primes, such as Airbus, for example. We then also show the SMEs, so the small, medium-sized enterprises and companies in supply chains to these larger companies. And you'll see that there are various hotspots, particularly in the UK, that there is a hive of activity. Uh, but if we take the Northwest and Southwest um, you can see that there's approximately 15 to 20,000 people actually employed in the sector within these regions. So that often means that um, there is a large prime or a, a large company such as Airbus or BAE Systems, for example, within that region. And then there are SMEs and companies within the supply chain surrounding that company. So it really does show you that, particularly within the UK, but it will be the case in other countries as well, that there will be hotspots of activity. You know, we take um, the Pacific Northwest, so Seattle in the, in the US is obviously home to Boeing. Um, there's going to be a plethora of companies surrounding Boeing in that sort of local area. So, um, and it's the same picture uh, in, in the UK. And then this slide here just gives you an example of sort of what I'm what I'm talking about really is the sheer number of companies in the supply chain um, that are involved in the Airbus A380 production line at Airbus. And these are all the companies that um, aren't Airbus themselves, but there's around 20 organizations here just in one region of the UK um, that um, are in the supply chain to the Airbus A380 production line. So this just illustrates the scale of the companies that actually feed into a single prime company. Um, so this just shows that when you are searching for jobs, really have a look at what's out there. But these next couple of slides is where you can actually locate these organizations. So we've all heard of the big, most of the big prime companies, but it's also the smaller companies and companies in the supply chain. Now, again, this is focused mainly on the, on the UK, but these organizations here are the trade bodies for the industry across the UK. And you can log, in, log on to their websites so such as Northwest Aerospace Alliance, Midlands Aerospace Alliance, and have a look at their directories of companies within, within those regions. So you'll not only be able to see the companies in, your, in the local area, but you'll also be able to target um, the job when the, target your job search when the time comes. So due to the fact that you will be getting a much broader picture of the industry and not just focusing on those larger companies. So really well worth sort of having a look um, at these organizations because you will be able to target those those job searches and have a look and discover organizations that might specialize in something quite unique um, and that will value your skills from whether, whether you are studying um, or whether you have previous previous experience. Um, it's also a similar picture across aviation as well. Um, in that there are trade bodies such as Airlines UK, um, which some of, some of you may have heard of at the moment with all the stuff that's going on with the airlines. Um, but again, you can search this organization and find directories of all the registered UK airlines. So perhaps again, some you may not have heard of because they specialize, specialize in such things such as chartering, like Titan Airways or cargo carriers such as uh, cargo logic so um you know these websites here and um, these bodies really useful to have a look at because it will give you a pinpointed search within particular regions and particular sectors um where you will be able to 
get a picture of the sorts of companies and organizations that are are around so um just quickly before i hand back over to arpad is rishi um there's just going to be a short poll that i would like um those of you who are um uh, attending with us today just to uh, complete quickly for us so if i can just invite rishi to send out the poll to everybody um and we, we'd really like you to um just complete that um, and we'll just give you a, a couple of moments to to complete that before i hand back over to to our pad so just see that um a few of you are voting there we'll just give you um, a couple of seconds and um, we're now going to focus more on the sort of employability skills that um, employers are are really looking for so um, if I can just invite Rishi to close that poll now um, and thank you all very much for uh, completing that so if I hand back over to Arpad thank you very much Great, thanks, Nick. Um, what we wanted to do next is, is really just to give you a snapshot of the sort of skills um, which um, which aerospace aviation um, organisations, but also others, are are looking for. Really, um, irrespective of what you studied, what you've um, what you've trained in, these are the sort of 21st century skills that um, will um, put you in good stead when it comes to. Um, a, applying uh, to, uh, to jobs. Obviously, tech savviness, uh, digital skills um, are um, essential when it comes to uh, anything to do with, uh, with, uh, with the aerospace industry, but also um, the ability to think critically. And of course, uh, especially now, um, the creativity and innovation uh, will play an essential role uh, in whatever you do. And I do understand that uh, the audience is very broad um, in terms of geography and also um, various disciplines as well. What I also wanted to highlight is obviously there will be an increased competition um, going forward for all jobs at all levels and of course hiring is dis discrimination. We don't uh, tend to say it out loud but it is and uh, what differentiates people tends to be especially um, towards the end of the process is their uh, professional or what we call their executive presence, which is a unique combination of uh, soft skills. And this is how an employer, uh, this is what an employer uses to essentially discriminate and make a decision as to who's going to be hired. Uh, just wanted to make a few points here. Um, I think I have five uh, soft skills in mind that will be um, that will have a measurable impact on your ability to get hired post crisis. One of them is um, composure. Obviously, the crisis has um, impacted everyone and, um, and in a negative way, uh, mostly. But these negative emotions can't be uh, brought to the interview. I think it's really important to bear in mind that you can't appear to be anxious, you can't appear to be angry or stressed out. You need to leave those things, those emotions at the door to really think about your mindset. Um, uh, and and uh, you have to show calmness and restraint. I think that's that's absolutely critical. Resonance is an, is another thing that I wanted to um, uh, mention which is uh, essentially emotional intelligence, uh, reliability. Can you read the mindset of the CEO or the hiring manager? And, and really, this is the uh, this is your ability to relate, and know what they've been through, and um, um, know what you can add and demonstrate that um, you are the right person for the job. And of course, vision will be something that a lot of uh, companies will be looking for. Um, someone who um, really uh, can bring in new ideas, can can identify new trends, um, how customers uh, might be engaged better, um, uh, and 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 uh, and I think that's going to make people really attractive because a lot of companies have been um, focused on survival. They need really need um, someone who can um, uh, help uh, think strategically and for in a forward-looking way. The other one I wanted to mention is is. Um, Humility, really, which is uh, uh, the ability to restrain yourself and don't act in an intellectually uh, superior way. Uh, I can say that I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers, but grateful to be part of the team. We'll figure it out together. I think that's that's really acknowledging that you don't have all the answers, 
don't oversell yourself. Uh, balancing it with um, with humility is uh, is crucial. Really, uh, it's it's essential. I think a lot of companies will be assessing you on that. And the last thing I wanted to mention is what I call practical wisdom. Is essentially translating all the um, the setbacks that you've had uh, throughout your career uh, and what you've learned and how did you grow. Um, I think also taking care of your personal brand, your understanding what makes you unique, your special skills, your ex experience, absolutely critical. But also the research um, and, the, and, and really researching the values, the culture of the of the organization. I know that it's very tempting to apply for anything and everything. I think that's not the right uh, strategy. I think you really need to um, find the right fit for yourself. And of course, uh, values, culture, that sounds really vague on, 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 until you're really in a situation um, when it's just not right. That's when you uh, really realize uh, what it means. Um, again, um, your social presence, your, your career documents, your CV, your resume needs to be, of course, um, up to date. And, and uh, think about your network, think about your references uh, much earlier than you really need them. I think. Um, Stepping into your um, um, broader network for referrals, information interviews, not so much face to face networking at the moment, but um, networking through social media is absolutely um, essential um, uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. The, obviously, most applications, most um, uh, processes will now be online which makes it really tricky to um, to stand out you will have to spend a lot of time uh, on your application I mean, again research will be absolutely critical you really need to make sure that you highlight your achievements and not your um, uh, sort of uh, job description i think that when it comes to cvs that's absolutely critical um, in most cases, when you're doing online applications, you can save your answers. Uh, I think it's really worth um, checking it, putting it into Microsoft Word to, to really just um, take advantage of the of the spell checker, um, make others around you read through it to ensure that there are no um, spelling mistakes, of course, because um, if there are, your application will be uh, uh, rejected almost um, immediately. So, copying and pasting, I wouldn't um, um, recommend it really because um, I think um, recruiters, um, search um, professionals are, are skilled at um, spotting um, those uh, tricks uh, quite uh, quite easily. Uh, they have very trained um, eyes. Um, as next, uh, I invite Jenny Jenny Edwards from um, Lockheed Martin to. Um, come on and, and um, talk to us about um, her experience with, um, with um, Lockheed Martin and what her uh, journey has been um, uh, up until now. Uh, Jenny? Thank you, Arpad. Um, before I start, I just want to say that this is kind of coming from my point of view. I'm not talking uh, from Lockheed Martin officially about careers advice. Uh, and obviously kind of following this advice doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get a job with us. It's more just useful things to think about when you're coming into this point of your career. Um, so I'm taking a slightly different route from uh, what our pads done so far. And I'm talking about kind of what 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 I found and what um, we, we look for in applications, especially when you're getting to uh, kind of 
kind of filling out uh, application forms for graduate positions, apprenticeships, um, direct entry positions, or general early careers uh, roles. Um, what I found the, the most useful thing to do is to plan. So part of what a lot of people struggle with is the amount of applications you have to fill out. And what you'll find is a lot of companies have fairly small windows of when they actually open and close their um, applications for, for early careers roles. For example, at Lockheed Martin, we open them kind of late September-ish normally. Um, and although they're officially closed in January, we usually run our first assessment centre um, the first week of December. If we fill our roles in that first assessment centre, we'll just pause the hiring process at that point. So it's quite important to plan out when you're going to apply for these different roles and how you're going to do it. Um, touched a lot on CVs, and I think there's a bit of advice coming up later on about it, but I just wanted to get across a few key points. So your CV needs to be informative, but it shouldn't be a novel. You don't necessarily want to be writing pages and pages because then someone, you know, to, to review it, that's quite long. So you want to kind of get across the key points um, in a short, short amount of time and be quite snappy with it. Most importantly for your CV, you need to think about what makes you stand out. If we get two CVs from the same person doing the same degree at the same university, what is going to make you stand out against someone else, um, one of your colleagues, one of your friends on your course? What's going to make your, your application different? And it might be as simple as in my spare time, um, I, I read these, these aerospace magazines or I've been learning to this new coding language. There's, there's a lot of small things you can do, even in this situation while we're all at home, about what you can do to help you stand out against the competition in this type of environment. Um, as I've mentioned, it's important to have uh, a kind of a base CV or a cover letter that you're not pay you're not posting exactly the same thing. You want to tweak things slightly to the role. If you're applying for an engineering role versus, um, you know, a, a role in, in the legal side of aviation, um, you can apply for different things, but you might want to have a think about the way you can sell yourself in those different opportunities. Um, and again, proofread. I can't tell you the number of times we've had some rather interesting things come through where people haven't, haven't, uh, fully proofread their CV and so they may have put the wrong company name in their cover letter and things like that. Um, you also want to talk about why your experience is important. You don't want to just say what you've done, you want to explain how that's going to be useful for you. So for example, when you've been on an internship or once you've, once you've done a certain module at university, how is that going to help you? It only needs to be a sentence, something short. Um, perhaps you've managed to save your, your previous company some money, perhaps or, or time to do a role, perhaps you think it would be useful because it shows you're a quick learner. There's lots of different, different benefits to that. Um, and finally, don't try and guess what they want to hear. This goes for both cover letters and online assessments. Um, you're never really going to know exactly what people are looking for, and companies aren't often trying to uh, fix one exact person into one exact role. They're just trying to have a think about uh, filling a broad range of opportunities for that. Great, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jenny. As uh, next, we wanted to give you a brief overview of um, a few networking techniques because um, um, during the pandemic, uh, networking is not going on hold um, at all. I think it's um, it's now more than ever uh, more important uh, than ever really to to reach out and basically um, uh, try to establish a solid um, network. It's about really serving people, getting to know them better. Uh, it's about earning trust and respect, and um, and uh, uh, because your network is your net worth, as the as the saying goes, over 80% of jobs are through referrals. They are not even advertised, and this is why it doesn't really matter what your discipline is. It doesn't matter what stage of your um, career you are at, uh, whether you're um, leaving school or you're already a postgraduate uh, um, student. I think it's um, uh, these um, tips will um, uh, will be helpful. I think um, when it comes to um, in-person networking, I think it's um, safe to say that for the moment or for the foreseeable future, um, there will be limited opportunities to um, to do that. Uh, but um, we wanted to still um, just mention them because in about half a year's time or maybe even longer day uh, events conferences will come back and uh, you can refer um, back to these slides uh, then wanting to really just um, make sure that you um, have these tips as well at your uh, fingertip tips um, i think building visibility and and uh, and forming um, mentorship allies and 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 really uh, 
a solid network around you will only benefit you again at whatever uh, stage of your um, career you are at. Um, the reason why it's uh, so important to do is because you need these trusted individuals who can basically uh, be brought in, used as a resource team uh, for you. So, you know, I mentioned a few. Um, you need someone who motivates you. You need someone who really um, can train you up on certain skills, uh, someone who can um, uh, make you accountable. This this person will make you make sure that you are uh, on course for whatever you want to um, achieve. Someone, again, to proofread things, whether you're sending out a resume, a cover letter, or, or a, um, a or any kind of uh, job-related document, <clears throat> I think it's quite important to have someone to have a look. Then, of course, connectors, these people who are um, basically very well connected uh, in various different organizations. You need to be uh, 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 having a relationship with them because they are the ones who can put you um, uh, in touch with people who can then have an informational interview. Uh, with you, uh, which can in some cases lead to um, job referrals and someone who can strategize with you, someone who can build a vision and who can really help you map out your um, uh, career strategy. Um, wanted to really just quickly um, mention a few ways of doing this online. Uh, I think on LinkedIn, or there are various other tools, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn. I think hosting a virtual meetup using Zoom or other technologies, basically putting together a group, whether it's alumni or industry contacts, talking about the industry over coffee, exchange ideas, those are um, some of the good ways of really not losing in touch with people and really, in fact, um, broadening your network, writing an article featuring other people's experience, on LinkedIn, you don't even have to have a magazine to publish it. Um, I think featuring there is a, is a really good way to, to get noticed, build up that portfolio of um, um, material that, um, that you can um, use in your uh, 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 search for employment. I think commenting in detail on someone else's post, I think really going into uh, Doing the making the extra mile and basically just um, uh, having a meaningful monologue with someone, I think that goes a long way as well. As well, but again, referencing, putting together an alumni group, I think these are some of the ways that you can really just um, leverage your um, your network and 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 showcase your expertise. Because again, um, things like thought leadership, really um, showing the world that you are good at something. Uh, that's going to be critical um, going forward. That's um, that's for certain. Um, as next, um, Jenny, we wanted to talk about the um, the various forms of, of um, assessment and how to um, prepare for them. The next slide really is just a snapshot. Um, obviously, depending on where you are in the world, you might not be um, uh, put through any of these, or maybe it's just going to be some of these. Um, Ways. I think what I wanted to make sure that you know is that there is a trend in recruitment. Again, it doesn't really matter what discipline uh, you're uh, pursuing. The gamification of um, recruitment is a trend, which means the companies are uh, very often incorporating interactive quizzes, company-related quests, uh, behavioral tests um, to use as a screening mechanism for really for a, for a more conversational, entertaining, and meaningful way of assessing people. Um, well, I think it's definitely not entertaining and it's definitely not fun. These are really tricky, really difficult. And what makes them difficult is that it's almost impossible to uh, prepare for them. That's um, that's the, the trick. There is a website, certainly here in the UK, but I'm sure that um, um, in your own country, you will find something similar, which helps you practice for the tests, um, uh, some of these tests that uh, employers uh, tend to use. And Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Arpad. Um, yeah, e echoing, echoing that, there's a lot of different opportunities um, and a lot of different assessment centre and interview kind of methodology out there. But just as some general hints and tips, um, especially for interviews as well as assessment centres, 
Um, do your research in the company before you go. Quite often people say, you know, why do you want to work here or what do you think this company can offer you? Um, there, there's always some some odd questions out there about the company as well, often you get, but um, I really recommend at least having a background knowledge of something as a company's done that you're particularly interested in or having a think about why why you want to go there in particular above other, other companies um, that might be quite similar. Um, reread your CV before you go. A lot of companies will break down your CV and ask you specific questions about it. So obviously you need to know what's in there. Um, hopefully well anyway, because it's your own experiences, but it's just something to remember that they can ask you um, anything on your CV. So just, just have a quick flick through. Um, there's something called the STAR method you can use for interview questions. Um, so I recommend having a Google and a read through of that. It's quite simple. Um, so it's uh, just having a think about kind of the way you answer questions before you do. It's OK to pause and take a minute to answer them. So don't don't necessarily feel you have to answer questions straight away. It's OK to kind of have a think about it before you do so. Um, and if you don't know the answer to a question, try to explain what you think it could be. So this is particularly for technical questions, but it could be for anything. If you if someone they ask you about a particular um, to prove a particular experience you haven't had yet, say how you think you react in that situation or what you would like to think you would react in that situation. Um, for assessment centres where there are team tasks, um, remember to contribute. So although it can be difficult, especially for introverts, um, you need to be able to kind of get your thoughts across and be part of the team. But you don't want to dominate. You don't want to take over and tell people what to do and force your opinions on others. It's quite a good idea to build off others' work, uh, whether they're good ideas or bad ideas. Try not to shut people down and instead to say, oh, that's a really nice idea, but what if? Um, take your time to think through any scenarios you're given. Um, and just remember that everyone you talk to in the room whether it's over lunch whether it's over a cup of coffee all those people will have an input at the end as to uh, whether they think you're a successful candidate or not um, another thing to think about is the fact that this is your chance to work out if you want to work for that company as well so while you're there take the opportunity to talk to um, other graduates or the people that are interviewing you ask any questions about what you think is important so the work flexibility other benefits whether they've got a cycle to work scheme for example might be something you feel important about childcare opportunities um, and just have a think about whether you fit into their, scenario, their, their situation and their company just as much as trying to persuade them that that's that you're a person they want to hire um, the final thing I just wanted to mention is obviously a lot of companies are interviewing by Skype or via phone at the moment. It can be quite difficult to interact in the same way. Um, obviously, there's going to be pauses and might, you might talk over each other. Try not to let it phase you as much as possible. Uh, companies will be aware that it's more difficult and they probably will try their best not to take um, the fact that you are talking over or the fact that you might have some, some awkward moments into account. Just keep calm, answer questions to best of your abilities um, and just kind of let it flow as much as you can so that it's almost like a conversation rather than a direct kind of bang 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 get the answers out there as quickly as you can thanks arpad no fantastic thank you thank you jenny um i can only um echo those things that you've said really i think it's um probably the most important takeaways that um, you really do your uh, homework uh, especially on the culture especially on uh, maybe even try to speak to people who are already with the organization so that you can judge and uh, and decide if it's um, really the um, the right place for you to uh, to be um, practice i think um, doing a, a few practice rounds with um, with um, family and friends i think that's um, that's something that uh, um, you should uh, you should do really so that it's not the first time um, when you when you're having to do it live basically with the with the organization. Most importantly, don't fake it. Be uh, yourself. Um, they can sniff out a phony in a very very short period of time if you're trying to be um, uh, someone who you are not. Um, I think um, as next, um, Jenny, uh, this is. Um, your bit. Yeah, I just wanted to speak a little bit about um, the kind of the next steps after you've got your maybe your graduate job, your direct entry job, your apprenticeship, and just about how to kind of manage um, the next the next few years. So obviously, I'm still very much in my early career, so I'm, I'm not going to claim to be an expert in any way in this. But it's just some kind of hints and tips I've picked out um, throughout what I've been doing and about how to kind of keep keep moving on, keep feeling yourself moving forward. 
Um, so one of one of the things that people talk about a lot is when you should move companies. And, oh, after three years you should move, or after five years, or stay in the company as long as you can. And I think one of the things I wanted to get across is that you should, um, if if you feel like you're not learning anything anymore, or if you feel like you're not developing, or if you feel like you're a bit stuck, um, I think then then it's time to start looking at either how you can expand what you're doing in your current role, or or start looking for an alternative role. Um, and I've just got some other kind of hints and tips for managing your early career. So um, it's just a case of like taking the advantage of the opportunities that are available for you um, and looking for ways to expand your learning. So trying to find new ways to, to develop um, as an early career is really important because it's one of the best times to kind of do training um, and to learn from a whole variety of people, uh, not only in perhaps your sector, such as engineering or the legal domain, but also kind of across the board. Um, don't be afraid to advise for advice. No one expects an, uh, someone starting off in their first job to know everything. Um, and that kind of goes to the, the bolding thing I've taken out on the side. Don't be afraid to try something as well. Just, just have a go, see what you can do. A lot of companies are really good for letting their early careers um, kind of develop in, that, in their own way and at their own speed. Um, find mentors and practice network, networking whenever the opportunity arises. Um, so not everyone is going to be happy to be cold approached on uh, LinkedIn or other situations, but whenever you're, especially in face-to-face -face meetings, when you might be going to conferences with the Royal Aeronautical Society or other professional institutions, it's a really good idea to kind of practice networking and try and make those connections that can help you develop further down the road. Um, the, the next three are kind of uh, just, just general hints and tips. So it's okay if you don't know exactly where you want your career to go straight away. If you don't know if your first graduate job is going to be exactly where you want to end up, that's not a problem, but it's important to start thinking about what you do enjoy, where you want to go, and kind of the next steps to get there. Um, it's important to be mindful of your work-life balance. So although you want to be taking opportunities, you want to be developing, um, you just also need to remember not to burn out too quickly. I think a lot of early careers suffer from taking on more and more responsibility, more and more opportunities. Um, and it can be important just to remember sometimes just take a step back, not be afraid to take holiday if you need it, and just be cognizant of your mental health, um, especially in the times like now where a lot of people find it quite difficult. Um, not being afraid to just say, you know, I'm going to just take a step back from something. And the final point, don't try and compare yourself to others who are in the same situation as you. Um, even if you're all on the same early career scheme, people are going to have different skills, people are going to develop at different rates. And I think it's quite interesting and important to just um, acknowledge that people are going to come from different backgrounds and therefore you shouldn't probably try and compare your career progression graph to theirs. Um, do what you can for yourself um, and just kind of try and try and keep yourself moving forward on your early career. No, thank you, Jenny. Very helpful. Uh, as next, I think um, Nick is going to um, give us a few tips as to what you can be doing in a downturn to um, to prepare for um, brighter and um, better times um, in the industry. Thank you, thank you very much, guys, for that. That, that was brilliant. So, um, uh, Rishi, I'm just going to invite the last poll to be sent out to to the attendees. So, um, Rishi, if you wouldn't mind just sending out the second poll which is going to be our, our final one i'd very much appreciate everybody if they could just fill that out um, uh, as quick as they can so that should be with you now so this is asking you whether this this current situation is actually making you question um your potential career within within this sector so i will uh, just give you um a couple of seconds to to complete that and then i'm going to talk about um these sorts of things that, that you can be doing to prepare yourself at the moment um during this sort of period of downturn it's it's really important to make sure you are prepared as possible um as as we mentioned earlier on um there is potential for the industry to to bounce back over, over the coming months in certain aspects and there are very very um many small things that you can be doing in the meantime that are going to make a big big difference so um Thank you to those who have uh, answered the, the question for us. Rishi, I'll just invite you to, to close that for us now. Thank you very much. And one of the biggest things that, that you can be doing at the moment is um, your CV, is um, 
making sure that it is as up to date as possible and that you are making the most out of it. Despite online recruitment methods, it is sort of knowing how to write a good CV does remain an essential part of preparing for employment. And these are some of our sort of top tips at the moment for you um, going forward in terms of the small changes that you might want to do to your CV. For some, it might be a big, bigger change, but this is just some general advice um, that we are, are giving around CVs. Um, so just outline a few key points on how it should be structured. The general advice really is that there is no written rule when it comes to structuring CVs here in the UK, but above all the structure is the most important element. Most employers spend a matter of minutes sort of reading over them, um, so they really do need to capture attention. Um, and this just highlights some small things that you, that you might want to do to, to your own CV, such as, you know, you might want to list your LinkedIn profile uh, or your LinkedIn link at the top. Um, and then focusing on your accomplishments, your education, work, ex um, work experience. We also think um, that the best layout for those people looking to begin uh, their careers um, is the fact that you need to create a sort of more skills based CV. So as we talked about, you need to focus on those transferable skills. There is an exercise in the handouts um, that actually provides you with a skills audit where you can actually identify those skills gaps. But um, lengthwise, two pages is the general um, length. Uh, for some, it might be longer. For some, it might be shorter. So for pilots or maintenance um, roles, it might be shorter. But two pages is the general length. Content-wise, it obviously needs to be relevant information, written in appropriate styles. Design-wise, I wouldn't go too over the top with design, wouldn't get too carried away with images, colour and fonts. But most of all, checking for mistakes. So as Jenny mentioned, you know, um, going back to that is checking for those mistakes. You know, the aerospace and aviation industry is highly safety critical. So, you know, you, you need to think, get in that sort of same mindset when you're proofreading your, your CV. It's just ironing out any spelling, punctuation or, or grammatical errors as well. Um, and then just a bit of inf last information from me. So I'm, I'm just conscious of time, but this is just a few of um, our top tips really for um, preparing yourself. Some are pad has covered, such as, you know, being active, maintaining your um, network, such as on, on LinkedIn and things like that. But the biggest things for me are to continue to remain active, but don't be tempted to go into a panic mode and apply for absolutely everything. Make sure you are matching your roles with your skill set, you are making that application count. Also, as we've mentioned, there are positives coming out of this um, in that um, we you know, we're not going to be in this in this, this um, crisis forever. So we're just making sure that you are prepared. Um, making sure you are as flexible as possible. You know, you may not find the perfect job in the perfect location. So making sure that you are flexible, which is, is really important. And then the final point I just want to mention from this is making yourself more employable by upgrading your skills and knowledge. And as you know, whether that's just reading aviation publications, looking on websites or finding online materials to train yourself, attending webinars, you know, like you're all doing now, you know, this is all a positive um, that you are upgrading your sort of knowledge and skills. So you're prepared as possible for when we come out um, of this, this crisis. So um, just going to finish off our last topic of the day before we go into the Q&A. So just over to our Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, last but not least, we wanted to cover a topic that um, doesn't um, um, get enough um, uh, spotlight. Um, I believe it's um, obviously the, the job search process is fraught with, um, with ups and downs, and not to mention the angst um, that comes with the uncertainty about the future of your career and love, livelihood. And we wanted to provide you with a few strategies as to how to manage the emotional uh, roller coaster of the um, job search uh, process. I think one of the most important things is, is really mentally prepare for what's coming. The, the process is, is um, it can take several weeks to uh, several months. Uh, some weeks will be good, some weeks will be more difficult. Um, uh, when you don't hear from anyone. I think knowing from the start um, that you will experience these swings uh, in activity and emotion 
can really significantly prepare you to better anticipate and, and handle them when they do occur. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the is the ability really to process your emotions. I think the best way to do that is to engage in uh, activities like uh, meditation, journaling, or anything that you find relaxing um, to avoid uh, suppressing and, uh, and uh, um, ruminating um, over your emotions. I think that's, um, uh, in, in a lot of cases, that results in anxiety and depression, which you want to avoid at, um, at all costs. So, um, processing your emotions through um, uh, whatever makes you uh, feel energized, I think that's, uh, that's crucial. Again, getting support, um, having someone to talk to uh, throughout your uh, job search, I think it's really important. Maybe a career coach, a therapist, a job search um, work group um, can provide uh, a lot of emotional support beyond what a friend or family uh, can provide, really. So, it's worth um, investing the time, energy, <clears throat> and also in some cases the money um, to um, to get help. And also <clears throat> sports, any other activity that basically takes your mind off the process. I think uh, it's crucial because if you're only fixating on on uh, on the problem of the need of finding a job, I think you're going to um, experience uh, a lot of uh, negative emotions, which can't really, <coughs> apologies, <coughs> can't really um, be sustained. Yeah, I think with that, my voice is gone. <coughs> Nick, if you would like. Oh. Oh, pardon me. Okay, that just, you, have, you have to take a minute, no worries. Thank you, thank you very much. So we'll just um, uh, finish off now. We'll, we'll go into the questions. So thank you very, very much for the questions as they've been coming in. So we're just going to go straight in. So um, we've got the first question here. So um, any insights about graduate scheme programs? Are, are they still available for 2020 university graduates or will um, graduates have to wait until next year? So Jenny, you might be the, the best person to, to um, answer this one at the moment about sort of graduate scheme availability. Um, obviously, um, you might be able to speak from your, your experience. Um, so Jenny, but feel free, Arpad, or um, yep. anyone else to, to join in. So. Sure. Um, yeah, good, good question. I think um, it's, it's difficult to answer as an entirety. I think it very much depends on the role you're looking at and also for the company you're looking at. Um, most big companies probably will have finished their recruiting for this year now. So uh, Lockheed Martin, Airbus, um, cert certainly a lot of those companies um, will have unfortunately closed, closed off their applications for now. But there's going to be companies, um, especially smaller companies, startup companies, um, and companies looking for direct entry uh, graduates rather than necessarily people who come on graduate schemes that will be hiring year round. Uh, so I think you might just need to refine perhaps what you're searching for, uh, but there should still be definitely careers out there. And I'd recommend looking on some of the websites that Nick suggested earlier to find them or doing a kind of blanket um, uh, search uh, on the internet for them because, um, yeah, pe people hide throughout the year. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Jenny. I don't know if anybody else, anyone else wants to add to that at all? No? Okay, so we'll go into the next question. So another one here, do you think uh, video CVs um, are a good tool when looking for a job in, in aerospace? So um, from this, I think, um, video and sort of the online world of recruitment is is going to become more popular and we're seeing a lot more video style sort of interviews and um application recruitment sort of processes in terms of companies using video technology to um look into look at their sort of uh, candidates experience and things like that um so i think potentially in the future an actual video CV is could be a good tool to have. As it stands at, at the moment, an actual physical copy of a CV is is still very important, and the sort of online um, aspect of um, 
recruitment methods is is very powerful but a lot of the times you still need to have a physical copy of a cv to upload um but i i certainly see it being perhaps used more more widely i, I don't know if anybody else has a, has any comments on that but i certainly definitely, think definitely. Nick, I think it's, um, it really depends on um, on the organisation that you are um, uh, uh, talking about. It's uh, it's a case by case sort of uh, situation. Uh, some companies ask you to prepare a um, two or three minute long um, video uh, presentation of yourself, really just talking about why you would like to be um, uh, considered for the role. Uh, tell me about yourself, really just just a few. Um, um, questions around yourself so that they can make a, a judgment as to whether they would like to interview you uh, on Skype or or in person but um, uh, to just have the CV in a video format I think um, uh, with in most cases we'll indeed have to uh, wait a little bit longer until that becomes common um, or, mm -hmm. or extreme really yeah mm -hmm. great thank you great question thank you so um, Next one is um, a bit more sort of current situation related. So um, do you think most of the job cuts are going to be made to the maintenance, repair and overhaul sector for manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce and GE? Um, or is the manufacturing side more affected? Um, I think from this, it, it is quite difficult um, to see at the moment obviously what's being announced um in the media you know with what's what's going on with airlines such as ba and virgin um you know they are making cuts generally across uh, across um their entire workforce rather than focusing on one particular um sort of uh team so um it i think only time will tell from this but I, I'm, I'm not sure what um what anybody else thinks about this. Nick, if mm -hmm. I can jump, it's Rose. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, in terms of MRO, um, I know we've had quite a few questions on, on here today. Um, mm -hmm. It is a mixed bag um, and it's mm -hmm. worth remembering that um, while many aircraft are obviously currently grounded um, and we've seen some announcements of sort of um, some parts of fleets now being retired, um, such as 747s today with Virgin. Um, there is still a need for airlines to continue um, running the aircraft and keeping them live for when um, you know flights are able to return. So we are seeing that some of those apprentices in the sector at the moment are still working. Uh, some are furloughed and some are not. Um, but most of them, apart from maybe one airline, um, which has already made a decision on their future, but I think the others have been pretty positive. Um, and one sort of really interesting part sort of issue that's come up is that we have got an aging demographic of aircraft maintenance engineers um, and even when we get through through this um, many people with that skills knowledge will be retiring um, so looking they are looking at that pipeline and I think they are very keen to try and maintain that um, mm. when it comes manufacturing again it is a mixed bag and we're seeing that in the defense side um it's i don't want to say business as usual but it's it seems to be pretty um similar to pre-covid situation um you know as jenny said lots of people are working from home but they're working on um projects and design and um, we've got companies like leonardo which are part of the um sort of COVID-19 response units so they're sort of working as much as they can as normal um, so there are some real positives out there um, and I think that there it will be slightly challenging for some particular organizations others will, will, will deem better but overall we do have this this need to get the next generation into engineering um, to help keep the pipeline going and to in particular look at you know the, the solutions we need for the sector um, particularly around sustainability as well so um, it's sometimes a question of bearing up you know it, it could be a bit challenging over the next few months but we hope to see you know a return to some some recruitment in those areas areas in particular mm. Mm. great thank you Roz no that, that's that's really good to know um, and um, just moving on to um, another question Rishi I might come to you with this one so um, what is recommended for a high school student who has just finished their GCSEs or A levels um, to do if they want to pursue a career as a commercial pilot so um, Rishi, I don't know if you want to tackle this one with your, your background in flying. Absolutely. So um, obviously, um, if you're coming straight from, from high school, there are obviously various um, options that you can go through. 
um, to, um, you know, in order to embark on a career as a pilot. Obviously, right now with the situation that we're in, um, everything is obviously quite fluid um, and um, depending on the impact of this situation, it may affect the, um, the entry routes in the future, um, especially with um, the way sort of flight training is conducted. Also, obviously, at a time right now, it's, um, it's obviously quite difficult. In terms of you know um, going going um, going on from high school to becoming a pilot, obviously um, the um, a lot of people believe that you may need a degree, but but you actually don't need to go to university. So there's there's actually no um, requirement of of a degree. Um, at the moment, the way it stands is that you can enter um, a, a flight training organisation at the age of um, 18. Um, so I mean the most um, FTOs prefer A levels. However, it's still not um, compulsory, um, but in in other in other ways, um, you can also you know to stay engaged with the industry um, from the, from from throughout school. Um, also, you know, take up um, extracurricular activities um, in high school, um, such as the air cadets, and also um, just sort of um, perhaps get um, get some flying experience in a light aircraft at a um, local airfield. And all of this would really help um, throughout your you know to um, throughout your training as an airline pilot, but also. Um, embarking on the career and getting into a, a flight training organization and it also really enhance your CV as well so perfect thank, thank you very much Rishi um, so the, the next the next question um, from us uh, revolves around apprenticeships so what advice would you give students hoping to get an engineering apprenticeship um, with an airline given the the current situation so I might turn to um, perhaps Ros with, with this one, um, or again, if anybody else wants wants to jump in um, on this one. Again, I think um, a lot of airlines um, we, we have seen are um, going through a bit of a recruitment freeze at the moment. But I think, as Ros mentioned, you know, apprenticeships and sort of the early career um, schemes that a lot of the airlines do run um, are going to be vital to sort of fill that gap of the ageing workforce. So I'm not sure if anyone else wants, wants to comment on that question. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to speak again. Um, you yeah. may be aware some of you that we are now involved quite heavily in the apprenticeships for the sector in terms of um, supporting the endpoint assessment, which is now a requirement of the UK apprenticeship standard. So um, again, what we're seeing is that where um, an organisation is, is looking to, you know, and feels it's going to make it through recovery, they're planning at the moment how they will be able to get um, new apprentices through. Um, one of the problems, obviously, of furloughing staff is that it, it leads to um, what we call a break in learning so it may delay the end of some of the current apprentices programs which might have a knock-on effect in terms of recruitment dates going forward um, but we would hope to see um, that the usual recruitment time for apprenticeships is in the sort of early part of the year between sort of January to, to March time so hopefully by the end of this year we will be looking at some organisations starting to put their programs out there um, for maybe September the start dates next year um, there may be um, not as many as available is in normal circumstances and to be honest with you they're really popular and they even in you know when when all things are going well they do receive a lot of applications so it's really important now to think about what you could do to um, get yourself to to be to really stand out and one thing that's vital for maintenance in particular is having what they call hand skills so being good with um, tooling um, and you know being a practical sort of hands-on sort of person so if you could get hold of an old bike you might find something the local tip which I think they've reopened today you know and you could be looking <laughs> at um, restoring it you know um, and, and you know being really creative in how you do that and, and getting to use you know use your hands which is something you may not have had a chance to do you know in your general education those are the kinds of things that will really help you I think stand out um, and in your applications and will hopefully give you some really useful starting point um, for, for this kind of a career. Thanks Ross brilliant so um, I might come to um, our pad with this one or so, sorry again Ros but we've had a question about um, what are the best tips to land a great mentor and how is it best to approach them? So, Alpad, I'm not sure if you want to to answer this one. I think, um, from my point of view, with sort of how to sort of land land a mentor is going back to Alpad's slides about thinking um, 
about those sort of 21st century type skills and using your sort of network that you may um, that sort of might be in the background and say not being afraid to you know connect with, with people on, on on LinkedIn and things like that you know if um, there is sort of a genuine question that, that you have for somebody or um, so Arpan, I'm not sure if if you want to jump in on that yeah yeah I think um, it's um, it's critical it's, it's um, especially for uh, um, early careers someone who um, who they can turn to and um, someone who um, can serve as a uh, as a, um, a person that uh, can guide them I think it's um, um, most people are open to it. I haven't really come across with uh, with anyone uh, during my career who was not uh, um, happy to um, serve as a sort of sounding board uh, for them. I think it's um, you just really need to be quite explicit. You need to you need to have the end goal in mind, and you need to uh, set quite clear expectations as to. Um, um, I mean, time is is, is money, uh, no matter what uh, uh, what you do, uh, what sector you're in, and and really just uh, agree on a sort of uh, timeline as well, how long it's going to be uh, for. And, and I think most, some of the most successful people um, have had mentors. Basically, they have had mm. some kind of. Uh, sounding board who they could really just engage um, and um, and uh, um, uh, get their views on their um, on their um, decisions really I think without it it's really difficult especially as someone who's just entering the the industry I think there are plenty of people out there who have been through the exact same things have been in your situation and would be happy to share their experience even if it's not a proper mentoring experience which is going on for many many weeks and months and years in some cases but someone who can really just have a an informational interview with you uh, and talk through um, how they did it and what would be um, the way that um, they would advise you to do it. So I think that that would be my um, uh, way of doing it. And again, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is probably the best way to really just um, locate these people and engage them. Mm. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for that, Arpad. So we've got a question here about um, sections of the CV. So asking if it's advisable to have a skills section in your CV, or is it best to highlight each skill in the work experience section of, of the CV? Now, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there isn't a written rule when it comes to, to structuring a CV. Um, but sometimes, um, speaking, speaking from my own personal experience with, 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 with my CV and when um, I tend to sort of look at CVs for, for recruiting uh, from my previous life, um, is having a skill section when perhaps you're not an individual who has spent you know a long time in an industry so for example if you are an early um going into this um industry you are new to this industry um really showcasing the skills that you're able to transfer on a piece of paper to an employer to an aerospace or aviation employer um, is really beneficial and having that specific section of the CV, um, which will focus the attention of the reader um, on your skills, um, can be be beneficial. But you know, um, if this advice is, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to have to take this advice. And I'm conscious that you know a lot of people will be getting conflicting information about CVs and things like that. And that's because there isn't that sort of written rule, there isn't that structure, and every employer might want something slightly different um, but from from my point of view having a separate skill section if you are early or new to this industry i think would be is quite beneficial i don't know if anybody else wants to wants to add to that no okay so um oh sorry um did someone want to jump in there it was me it's ros now i just yeah. wanted to <laughs> what you said nick um it's really yeah. important to 
and, and Jenny pointed this out that your CV it needs to be quite easy to scan and read um, mm -hmm. employers receive hundreds if not thousands of these um, on a regular basis um, so what they're looking for is to be able to easily find that key information and they really want to know more about you you know your qualifications are vital but they are not the only thing they want to know they really do want to see um, who you are as a person what you do in your spare time what sort of soft skills you have um, and they will want to come back to that when they're reviewing different people um, who often do have very similar educational backgrounds you know so this is the thing that really will help you so i, I really did want to just you know agree there with nick to be fair <laughs> yeah. just just one one more thing nick um uh, i think the best way to think about it is basically if your cv is not mobile optimized then you are already in a disadvantage because um recruiters uh, um internal external they are flicking through cvs on their mobile phones it's not like they're printing out uh, cvs or not even some of them don't even use their um their computers uh, to look through mm -hmm. them and if, if, if you don't mention the keywords that they're looking for um in bold or italics or if it's not readable they're just going to overlook it and uh, get on to the next one average average um uh, number of seconds they spend on a CV is around 20. So, um, so mm. that's, that, that's something to bear in mind. Again, no matter where you're listening into, from Singapore to Los Angeles, it's going to be the same. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you for that, guys. So I think this is probably going to be one of the last questions that we're, we're going to have time for, unfortunately. Um, uh, Jenny, I might come to you for this one. So what is the best approach to grad schemes, internships when lacking engineering experience, but have built up soft skills through through other jobs? So um, really just out, outlining here again, the importance of the transferable skills and how um, you know, really you sort of come across is, is really important. But Jenny, I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah. I've been flicking to some of the questions being there that have been coming in about, oh, I've got this specific degree, how do I get into this area? Yeah. And I think it's really important to emphasize that you don't have to have the exact degree that you're applying for graduate uh, placement for. As I said, I did physics at university, astrophysics, um, and I'm now a systems engineer. So I think it's more about having the background knowledge base, background learning, um, Obviously, there are a lot of things you can do to improve this. So internships are really useful, though I appreciate they're difficult to get at the moment. But things like um, keeping an eye out and being able to sign up for engineering journals um, or, you know, keeping an eye on the press, also learning kind of uh, different uh, computing skills, learning different soft skills. There's not really a right way to do it. It's about showing that you're willing to learn. We take people from a range of STEM backgrounds every year. We take mathematicians, physicists, engineers going into different types of engineering. And it's not that you have to have a really set course into what you want to be as a graduate. It's about being able to show through learning, through experiences, um, that you've kind of got the opportunity and that you're willing to learn and take, take experiences and uh, that kind of stuff as they come. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Um, I think we, we've probably got one time uh, time for another question. Um, so this one is talking about um, this person is is studying physics and mathematics with flying experience um, and has a very broad interest across science, aviation, maths, and engineering. Um, but unfortunately, this means that um, I'm feeling confused. I don't know how to focus my energy on a career path. Any any advice? Um, <laughs> I am 34 also. So um, very, very interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, I will just I'm going to open this out to anybody who wants who wants to join in who might be to focus just to tackle this question than myself so um i don't I may, yeah, go, yeah go on our patch yeah yeah go on think, um, <laughs> um the most important thing is is, is really the, the self-review bit that i mentioned briefly earlier i think you really need to be um, honest with yourself i mean you can't possibly be interested in everything i mean it's basically you need to narrow it down to that two or three um core areas that you can imagine yourself 
and then even that is quite broad. I mean, you, it's a STEM. You can't be interested in STEM. I mean, you need to be, um, you need to hone down because um, you don't want to spread yourself too thinly. I think it's uh, um, one of those mistakes that people tend to, um, tend to make, that they really uh, want to be jack of all trades. You can only be good at one or maximum two, two skills and, um, the, the only way to find out is is, is really an honest self-review. I'm going to disagree with Arpad slightly. Um, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I also wanted to be uh, in aviation and then in aerospace and then in space and then in defence. So I have bounced a lot all around a lot and I appreciate the kind of conflicting messages and the different ideas between uh, perhaps where you see see the career going, so where, where you want to progress the quickest or where you want to kind of earn the most most quickly. Um, and, and great that you're good at a lot of different things. I think that, that's really valuable. Um, I, I agree with Arpad though, you do need to kind of take a little bit of a moment to actually think about, well, if I do have to make a decision, uh, take, take some time to internally reflect, but also reach out to people in the different industries and talk to them and get a better appreciation of what their jobs actually are. It's very easy to glamorize what careers look like and what the different industries look like. And it can be really valuable just to kind of have a chat to a few different people and work out who, who you want to be in five, 10, 15 years time and work a plan to get there. Um, I also think that although you obviously want to apply to a graduate scheme that is in the correct field, you can move around after that. There's, there's, no, there's, not, there's no rule that says if you go do systems engineering in a, in a space company, you can't then go do mechanical engineering uh, five years down the road in a defense company, say. And I think a lot of the, well, one of the really nice things about the Royal Air North Society and being in this industry is there is so much overlap and people are quite willing for people to move around, whether it's from being engineers into specialists or into slightly different professions, you do have the opportunity later on. So worry less about kind of what you should be doing now and worry more about building on the skills you've got and just finding your way into the industry in the first place. Perfect. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, guys, for that. So, thank you all for um, for those questions. Unfortunately, we're we're, we're out of time. Um, but um, if you do want to follow up with us, please do email your questions to us, and we'd be happy to to tackle those those for you. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Ros very, very quickly just to finish us off with um, with a summary. Yeah, well, I just want to say thanks to everybody. Um, and, you know, we have just slightly gone over. We've had so many questions. Um, mm. and, you know, it's been our very first webinar, so we didn't know how much um, interaction we would get. And that's been brilliant to see that. And we will come back to you. So we will put together um, a, some sort of report and um, you will all receive the slides. I know lots of people have been asking about that and we're so pleased that you found them useful. Um, but can I just say thank you to Jenny and Arpad for, um, you know, from our membership for coming in today um, and to do the talk with you they spent a lot of time preparing um, and we really appreciate that when um, everybody is very stretched at the moment so I just want to say thank you and if we were in a conference room we'd be applauding you right now um, I also want to say thank you to Nick um, again for a great presentation and also putting together the webinar today he's worked very hard on this um, and to Rishi as well who supported Nick um, and has been moderating in the background for us and given us that technical support that we really wanted to have um, and all I want to say to, to everybody is you've had some really useful tips today um, we can't tell you that it won't be tough you know we've sometimes you know with them um, you know every sector is, is facing this crisis this is you know and it is particularly challenging particularly for aerospace and civil aviation um, but you know do prepare prepare for recovery um, you can sometimes do other things and come back to this sector as well. You know, there are many, um, you know, similar roles in, in industries which may pick up slightly more quickly, um, but that will enable you to return to aerospace and aviation. So never give up. Um, think about networking, um, getting the mentor mentoring support that you need as well. Um, but do be ready, you know, because we, we will come back um, and we will have um, really fantastic opportunities um, in maybe a different market, but still a market. And, you know, people um, want to be connected and we want to help connect them. So um, don't forget, we have got our careers website with lots of information on there and we will be running future webinars as well. So look out for those. Um, and if we can, in the autumn, we'll try and run our 
our careers fair, which we usually do every November, um, either virtually or as a face-to-face -face event if social distancing and recruitment allows. Um, but in the meantime, you've got our details. Um, come to us with any advice and support that you need and just look after yourselves and please stay safe. And thank you again to everybody for today. Thank you, Roz. I just want to reiterate the thanks to our panellists, Jenny and Arpad. Really, really appreciate you giving up your time. Um, and thank you all for, for attending. Apologies for the slight technical issues at the, at the beginning and for running over slightly. So it is, has been our first webinar, so it's a bit of a learning curve for us. But please do join us for the future webinars that we, we will be running. And please do contact us at our email address there if you have any further questions and say this will be this is being recorded and will be available um, on uh, our YouTube channel within the next sort of 48 hours or so. So, um, and the slides will be available as well. So, thank you all very much indeed. Um, it's been a pleasure and look, take care of yourselves. Um, thanks a lot and bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 B